Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Christy Roskowski. I'm a member of the Master Gardeners Program Committee that in most months puts on a presentation on the fourth Thursday of the month. I am delighted this evening to be able to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Phil Nixon, Dr. Phil Nixon is now retired from uh, the University of Illinois Extension where he was an entomologist for many years. Those of you who are master gardeners and master naturalists need no introduction because Phil for many years has been telling, teaching us all about insects, but he is also well known across the state of Illinois. He has great expertise in insects in turf trees and ornamentals and he's been a leader in pesticide education training and an advocate for integrated pest management. Well, despite all these wonderful credentials, that's not why he's here tonight. He's here tonight because since his college days, Phil has led a secret life. He has been interested in bonsai since college when, as he told me, one day he looked around his dorm room and realized the plants he were, was keeping were outgrowing the room. So he turned to bonsai at that point, thinking that they might be a little more manageable than the plants that he had. Since, those, since that time, he has been involved in studying and creating bonsai. He is a founding member and remains active in the Bonsai Society of Central Illinois. Tonight, he is going to introduce all of us to bonsai, and I hope after he finishes that you will all be beginning a, your own long journey with bonsai. Just a reminder, please keep your mics turned off, and um, if you have a question, you can just type it in chat. So, Phil, please bring the world of bonsai to all of us. Okay, uh, so I'm here to talk about bonsai, and it is pronounced bonsai, like B-O-N-E-S-I-G-H. You hear, hear many people say, you talk about uh, bonsai, and as I understand it, in Japanese, bonsai means tomorrow. Bonsai means planted tree. Bonsai means attack. Uh, why would they have such a strange language that has more than one pronunciation for the same same word. Have you ever looked at your own language with read and read and read? Okay, so not so strange after all. Uh, bonsai is a very ancient art. It uh, was first started in around 700 AD, as best we can find in China. And it's something that uh, has been gone through most of the Far East uh, in various parts, uh, various forms. There is a style, the style of, in, of bonsai in China, which is pronounced uh, Penjing or Penzai. Uh, Penjing is more of a, what we would call a dish garden, only the dishes are four, six, four to six, eight feet long, uh, but uh, many times, <clears throat> but, uh, but they have a combination of rocks and trees and so on and so forth. Uh, the, uh, the Japanese are, are, have taken a, uh, the uh, the bonsai art and developed it into their own form, which uh, which is which is more stringent than others. But there is a Korean style of bonsai. There's a uh, there's a Vietnamese form of uh, dish garden uh, that involves bonsai associated with it. Uh, the um, uh, Thai have have a different style of bonsai. The Indonesians do, the Indians do in India, okay? And uh, it got into this country probably around World War II, essentially after World War II, there were, uh, there were, um, uh, the GIs kind of brought back the idea of bonsai with them. And so um, what I'm gonna start out with is gonna show some various styles of bonsai. We'll start out looking at, at this one here. And uh, it's a, uh, it's actually a uh, a Chinese elm, okay, cork bark Chinese elm, okay, and uh, it's in what we call the informal upright, which means that it's uh, I mean it's it's got some uh, it's not a it's not a completely straight trunk, 
but it branches towards the bottom. A formal upright would be something like a spruce tree where you have a central trunk and you have branches coming off of it and the trunk is straight. Uh, most trees that we have are informal uprights if you look at them out in, in the landscape. And in fact, most bonsai trees are that way as well. Um, some things that are shown here, this is very much in the Chinese style of bonsai because it has a fairly deep pot. If you had a very, uh, if this was going to be a, and it also has a lot of foliage. And so if this was going to be a, a, uh, a classic Japanese bonsai, it would have much less foliage. Foliage would be arranged in fans or flat areas associated with it, or clouds, they call them. And, and a standard Japanese bonsai has a trunk which is no deeper than the diameter of, of, the, of, the, of the pot, is no deeper than the diameter of the trunk. And so you would have this tree planted in essentially a one inch deep pot if this was a, was a classic Japanese style bonsai. So the Chinese have a much more flowing form. In fact, essentially all of the, all of the bonsai that, that my wife and I do, that happens to be my wife's plant, uh, Carrie, and, uh, and uh, we tend to do Chinese style bonsai because for one thing, uh, we have other things to do than to water the plants six, eight times a day. Uh, the very, uh, the, the very uh, conformed Japanese bonsai have gardeners which water several times a day because they're planted in such shallow pots. That means you kind of have to be independently wealthy and, uh, and uh, we certainly don't fit into that category. And so that's one form of, uh, of bonsai, probably the most common one. Okay. Um, another form of bonsai that we would look at would be, uh, would be the, uh, this one, which is actually a, uh, a Japanese garden juniper. Okay. And uh, it's in what's called a semi cascade form. Cascade form indicates that the, that the foliage is going down off the side of a pot. And typically in a classic, uh, semi-cascade, the, the bottom part of the lowest part of the foliage should be below the upper part of the pot, the upper lip of a pot, which is what this one is. A full cascade or cascade, the, the foliage would actually extend below the bottom of the pot. And this is characteristic of the types of things you would see growing on a hillside. And, uh, and most of the, uh, of the Chinese and Japanese styles are associated with what, with what they see in their country and being very hilly and mountainous areas in certain parts of China and in most of Japan, uh, you get a lot of that, that sort of situation. Uh, both, the, uh, both the elm and, uh, and, and this one are both in, in plastic pots, but this is more in a, in a, in a regular uh, bonsai pot. They tend to be relatively, relatively low in, in height compared to the, to the width. Uh, of course, uh, Western pots are typically the same depth as the diameter of a the pot, they are equal. So a six inch pot, that you go out and buy a terracotta pot in a nursery is going to be six inches across, six inches deep. That's generally the case may be. Uh, bonsai are, are put in smaller pots and, they, and the bonsai are kept small. They're not special trees, they're not special shrubs. They're kept small by, by constricting the root system. And so you're actually growing the plant on kind of an edge to a certain extent. And that brings me into one of the major four points associated with bonsai and gets into what Christy, as Christy introduced me, and that is, is that this actually became the case with me. And the thing is, is that, uh, that the rule of thumb, it kind of says, is that if growing and keeping plants, maintaining plants has become so easy for you that it's starting to be boredom. Going into bonsai will keep you from ever being bored and ever not having a challenge because you end up growing the plant more or less on the edge. You know? Is it cruel to have a bonsai? Some people will say it is because you're constricting the root, constricting the root system and you're pruning it back, you're styling it, and you're being very, very aggressive that direction. From the same standpoint, it'd be cru cruel to repot a plant then because you're changing the soil on it. It would be cruel to go out and prune a tree because you're cutting off an arm, so to speak, okay? So is it cruel? No, probably not. Particularly since these plants probably wouldn't be alive if they weren't as bonsai. 
So uh, I won't get any deeper into, into, into theory than that, but uh, we'll leave it, let it go at that. But that's a, uh, but that's a, a Japanese garden juniper and, uh, and it's an example of another type of bonsai. By the way, uh, both of these are things that you can commonly buy in a, uh, in a garden center and so on. This is another one that we've got, and that's a dwarf crepe myrtle. Okay. Uh, you notice I kind of turn the turn the bone side when I when I bring one out, and associated with that is because there is always a front and a back on a bone side, and uh, and in my uh, in my plants, my between my uh, my wife and I, we have uh, we have plants that are. Uh, my plants have orange tags in them and her plants have blue tags in them. That's the way we can tell. So every once in a while I get around to it, is that our plant, my plant or your plant? And, well, you know, let me see, do you want it? No, at any rate. So, um, so that's kind of way it comes from, uh, because in the backside you have, a, you have branches sticking straight out at you, which is not a good thing, but you can have that on the backside of a plant because it ends up filling in the space and giving it depth in the plant. So uh, this is, a, again, an informal upright. And a form that I kind of like, uh, it's reminiscent of the uh, of some of the flat top plants that you tend to have, as for instance a uh, a very old uh, Austrian pine. Uh, and uh, for instance, we'll get up and get kind of a flat top associated with it when it's growing in the landscape, or a um, or a honey locust will get a flat top associated with it as it ages. Or uh, if you're a fan of PBS and you watch Nature. Their acacia that they have in their opening uh, uh, from in Africa shows a flat top sort of thing. So this is kind of flat top, but it's in layers associated associated with this, and it forms fans that come out. And this is essentially something that I bought in a nursery in this area. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was in Effingham, but uh, where they're a little more a little more hardy that far south, they're marginally hardy here. This is probably a zone six to uh, to zone. 10 or 12 uh, plant. We're in zone five, so it's a little bit marginal. Um, next one I want to talk about is this one. This is a style we call a slant, and this is a chimpaku juniper. Uh, it's in a uh, it's a variety of of chinensis, juniperus chinensis, and as you can see, the the, the trunk is on a slant. So it's not quite an informal upright, it's a slant. You see that many times associated with a lot of wind action, or if it's growing out on a hillside and kind of growing up the, sl up the hill, so to speak. Okay, and so, uh, and so these are, this, is a, this is one of my plants that, uh, uh, and then many times associated with a slant, you're gonna have a branch that goes back the other direction. And this one conforms more to us, to a, to a traditional Japanese bonsai in it, it doesn't have a lot of foliage on it, and it forms a triangle shape, three-sided. And that's very much the case associated with a uh, with, with Japanese style bonsai. Chinese a little more a little more laid back, a little bit uh, a little bit freer associated with that, which is uh, which what my wife and I tend to like. Um, you put but you put one of these other things in the show and it would get it would get nailed seriously because it ain't right. It's too Chinese. <laughs> That's not what they would say. They just say it's not right because all they know is uh, is Japanese style bonsai, uh, which is okay. It's all right. Some people always ask too: Is uh, do bonsai flower? And yes, if you have a flowering plant. Okay. Many of you will know to recognize this. This is a lantana, lantana camara. Okay, it's a scientific name. Again, it's an informal upright, all right? And uh, and it's uh, and many times you can you can prune it back and get it to come in. This one had a lot of a lot of this area. This this is a plant that does a lot of what we call back budding, which is a great thing to have. And it essentially, if you if you treat it right, we'll get in a little bit more on hormones and so on, plant hormones and pruning. Uh, but essentially, what it comes down to is that if you have a uh, if you can prune it back many times at the top, you will cause branching to occur down on the stems. And you can see in this particular area, we've got some coming out right here, okay? And uh, so uh, new, new, new shoots 
which is a neat thing to have. And not many, not every plant will back bud very well. Most of your of your conifers, junipers, spruces, pines are horrible at back budding. They don't do that very well at all. Some plants do a lot of back budding, such as this lantana. Um, also, uh, uh, azalea uh, is uh, is very good at back budding, um, as well as um, as uh, Don Redwoods. Uh, you can hawk them back and they'll sprout out wherever you want. And so this is one in which a month ago, I decided I didn't have anything back down in here or something, so I headed it back a lot. This had branches that were going up twice the size of what it is now. I headed those back because we really hadn't done anything most of the summer with it. And a lot of this growth, these sm the small and stuff here, is uh, has all come on since in the last month and filled in the plant to a great extent. And so you can do a lot of things with it. But the important thing is, is that, yeah, they can, they can flower. And this gets me to another point that I want to try to make a comment with. And that is that, is that with, the, with the elm, with the, uh, with the juniper and so on, and even with the crepe myrtle, you're looking at temperate type plants. Many people who buy bonsai will buy a, will buy a, uh, uh, many times the first one they get, in a big box store or something like this is going to be a uh, going to be a Japanese garden juniper like this one. It's inside the building when they buy it, and so when they take it home, they put it on a coffee table, or at the best, they put it in a windowsill. But in reality, almost all bonsai are outdoor plants. See, we're looking at at something where we have somewhat of a of a Western European type idea that if it's in a pot, it comes, it goes inside, and if it's in the ground, it stays outside, that ain't necessarily the case. When it comes to bonsai, you have potted plants that if it is a temperate type plant, such as a juniper, this should be the, this and maybe one or two other days should be the only day this, these day, this plant should ever be indoors. It should be outside the rest of the time, winter, spring, summer, fall, all the schmear, okay? And when you're looking at a tropical plant such as this, such as such as the lantana, uh, those you can actually have indoors, but they do much better being outdoors. And this one's been outside all summer. It's inside our we have a lean-to greenhouse in our house. Goes into for the winter, and we try to make sure it doesn't get above below about 45 degrees in there. And we have ficus and so on in there. If you have house plants inside, there's kind of an old saying that goes, is that uh, particularly around bonsai people, that if you have a tropical bonsai, it languishes during the winter and grows in the summer. Because then in the winter time, you get a reduced light. It doesn't get near as much light as it should. And ideally, when it comes to summer, you take it out in spring, summer and fall, you, you take it outside and bring it in before it gets too cold. Only out in that higher t higher lights and and fresher air are you going to get the type of growth you really need to have, and that goes for most house plants. So, you know, your people who tend to have the most success of house plants are moving them outside in the summertime, and so bonsai are really not indoor plants, and that's where most people who try bonsai have a problem because they take an outdoor plant, put it inside because hey, it's in a pot, it goes inside. No. No, no, okay. So your typical typical plant, you can see some yellowing showing up on, on this elm. That's early fall coloration associated with this. This plant will go completely yellow, drop its leaves for the winter time, and it will spend the entire winter outside, okay? Uh, the only thing you need to be concerned about is you do not want that root system to freeze and thaw. It can freeze and then fall once but it should not freeze and fall repeatedly. And that's kind of a horticultural fact when it comes to, uh, comes to container plants in this, in this part of the world. And so, uh, and so there's various ways that you can overwinter your bonsai. Uh, many people will, uh, the simplest way is to dig a hole in the ground, put the pot down into the ground to the, to the lip and leave it there for the winter. When it gets warmer and, 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 and the nights stay, stay uh, above freezing, you know, uh, consistently, you can bring it out, put it on, a, put it on, your, on your porch or whatever for the summer, and it goes back for the wintertime. Uh, tropical plants, such as lantana, comes in to a protected area, stay warmer for the summertime, for the wintertime. 
Next one I want to look, show you is this one. We had some questions that were brought in before, and that was the question is, is, is can you keep a ficus as a bonsai? Yes, you can. This is a Golden Gate ficus, ficus retusa. There are approximately 350 different kinds of, of ficus, and so, uh, or figs, and so this is one of them. This is more or less an alliterati style, except for this branch and this branch. So you kind of cover it up, and you have what's called a literati. Literati in Japan, Japanese is referring to the learned people, the artists and the writers and so on. And if you look at Japanese woodblock prints, you see minimalistic trees in those prints. They show the essence of a tree. They don't show the whole tree. You don't have a big foliage mass like this. You have a reduced mass foliage mass like this. And you're trying to show a progression from the root up to through the stem and so on to it. Or sometimes in bonsai circles, we kind of say, if you can't figure out what else to do with a plant, make it into a literati, because there's almost no rules there, okay? The last plant I want to show you before we get down into making a, or starting a bonsai, we're not going to make one, we're going to start one, is, uh, is this plant, okay? This is a Kingsville boxwood. Another hardy shrub, okay? And this one's called a tree over rock or root over rock type style, okay? Very characteristic of what you would see. I need to get it up on a riser. Just remembered that, there we go, okay? Essentially you have this one going up over a rock, okay? That's probably the front, it's best we can do, all right? And of the various pots, we've had the last one here. This is in a ceramic pot. This is a ceramic pot. The rest all in plastic. Why do I use so many plastic plants? Plastic pots? They're cheaper. I also have plastic plants that are made in the bonsai. Okay. I almost brought one tonight. Uh, but at any rate. <laughs> uh, and many times people will ask, you know, how, is, uh, and essentially this is crawling out over a rock. And they will ask, you know, many times, they, they get excited, people that are not into bonsai, they're always wanting to know, how old is the plant? <clears throat> how old is the bonsai? Well, what do you think is the oldest bonsai here that I just showed you? Obviously, you can't respond. Some would say this because it's big. Some would say this because it's gnarled, goes over the rock. It's actually this one. This plant is 35 years old. I've been styling it for 35 years. Okay, it's had some dieback. It was considerably larger at one time. It's had some dieback. It's been it's been uh, fed upon by voles. It's been smashed by a dog a couple three times, and uh, it it hangs on and it does very well. And you can see that it's got even some uh, age showing up on the trunk. Okay, this is actually the oldest bone side that I have, and uh, and the best I can tell, I start styling this as best I can remember, somewhere around 1984, 85, somewhere around in there. And it's been in my position and been doing it. It's the oldest one that I have. So how old are the oldest bonsai? Well, there are two trees that are known to be at least a thousand years old that are bonsai. One of them is a ficus, it's a fig, in Italy. It happens to be at the front entrance of a botanic garden in Italy, okay? And the other one happens to be a juniper in Japan, all right? The oldest bonsai probably in the United States is a, is a, is a, is a, is a Japanese five needle pine that was donated to the, to the US government in, by the, by the uh, country of Japan in observance of the US's 200 year anniversary. So in 1976, the, the, the uh, country of Japan made a donation of plants. The oldest one of that was, the, uh, was this one, which was 300, which now is about 370 years old. And it is a survival of Hiroshima. It was actually was growing two miles away from the explosion of the atom bomb in Hiroshima, or Hiroshima, and it survived it as well as the whole family inside the house. 
In fact, the person who was in charge of it was in his 40s at the time, and he lived to be 95 years old before he died. So, uh, and grandchildren and so on have come to visit the tree. Obviously, it was a lot older than he was. And bonsai in Japan and in China and so on are passed down from generation to generation. And if you're kind of wondering, yeah, there has been a few cases of Harry Carey in which you let great, 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 great grandfather's tree die. And so you killed yourself as a result. So Chinese, the Japanese get very serious when it comes to bonsai, <laughs> okay? So, uh, so let's get into, into looking at some, at some bonsai, and I'm going to try to make one here for you or start one off. After all, the whole thing is talking about starting. And I'm going to go from a sitting position to a standing one, and we're going to, get, uh, we're going to switch gears here in a span of a couple minutes. We're going to make a mess, and then I'm going to leave the town and let everybody else worry about it. It's the way people are, right? All right. And so one way that you can, you can do for, go for making a, a bonsai or starting out a bonsai is to start out with a, uh, with a nursery plant. This is a plant that I bought at Prairie Gardens about three weeks ago, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. It has a price tag of $159.99. And they right now have their Japanese maples. This is a Japanese maple. Had it marked down by uh, 30%. And then I bought it on a Tuesday. And for those of you that are that are Prairie Garden wise, you know that if you're in their club, so to speak, or whatever, that you get 10% off on Tuesdays. So I paid $103 for this tree. Okay, and I have 40% off. Okay, and what it is is it's a Japanese maple, lace leaf, lace leaf maple, variety waterfall, but it is a Japanese maple, uh, Acer palmatum. Okay, and this is one. And what you're always looking for with a with a with a bonsai plant or a tree is looking for something that's going to be. Uh, let me get this guy out of a pot if we can. You're looking for something that tends to have small foliage. People will say, "Well, what can you make into a bonsai?" Well, essentially, if it's a woody plant, you can make any plant into a bonsai. Ah, this is interesting. We got. I was hoping that would be the case. Two thirds of this pot is nothing but soil and bark. So I was guessing we might have a lot less of a plant. This is the first time I'd had it out of the pot. So I didn't know for sure. Okay. Many times you get it like that, you can start looking at the tree and seeing what you want to do with it. Okay. Uh, and so uh, yeah, we'll leave a tag on there for now. I might have to take it off in a few minutes. At any rate, uh, we get some of these other tags off of it, so you can see the trunk a little bit better. But this time of year is a great time of year to buy a bonsai uh, stock plant because uh, they don't want to take them through the winter. And you start looking at the plant, and you start looking to see what you might have as far as a tree. Now, there's two ways of looking at this, and one way is I want this kind of a tree, and I'm going to make it look that way. That usually doesn't work well. The tree itself has certain characters with it. And in selecting this plant, I looked at every Japanese maple that, that Prairie Gardens had, and this is the only one I would take home, okay? Uh, so, uh, but there are probably ones that you might take home. But at any rate, uh, and there are several ways you can look at it. One thing is you start looking to see, see how you might want to style the plant. Well, there's a couple ways you can do that. You know, you can, you've got to, uh, you could do an informal upright and, and essentially, you know, one, way, one neat thing you do in bonsai is you cover up the foliage to see what it would look like. You know, and that, what, what it would look like without that foliage with your hands, right? And you look at the plant and you look it around. One thing that you do many times, you put it on a turntable. Happen to have one here, okay? And you can look at various sides of the, of the plant. Okay, you can see in this particular case, this thing's centered here, so it turns, there we go. Uh, you have this branch coming out this direction. It's essentially coming right at you, so many times you wouldn't want that to be the front of your plant, all right? You don't wanna have a plant branch coming straight at you, but poking you between the eyes, so to speak, in your vision, all right? 
And similarly, you know, you've got you've got a uh, a fairly low branch coming out here. You could prune that off. See what it would look like without it. Then you pretty well have to take some of this off here. Um, that's an option. Keep going around on it. The way the branches are going with, with, with strong ones going both directions like this, tends to be something like you tend to feel like you've got, the front is going to be from this direction, or it's going to be from this direction, okay? And what you need to, and, and looking at it from the top, you can see that it's got a lot more foliage on this side than it does on this side. And so it's probably going to work better to use some of this heavy foliage to kind of fill in the back and make it a three-dimensional plant, something you always want to do, but to have very little in the area where people are looking. And so we're probably going to be looking at this being the front of a bone sign. Okay. Let's see if it looks that way to me. Yeah, I think so. You look at branch structure, see what's going to happen associated with that. This branch is coming out and showing in good shape looking nice, uh, this sort of thing, okay? Another way that you could look at this is that you might want, to, might want to adjust how it's actually in the pot. It came in the pot essentially like this, all right? The root ball is a little bit canny wapus here, okay? So you can actually put it in the pot a little bit more at an angle like that, make a semi-cascade out of it. You could even go so far as to bring it even more so, bend this down and make it a cascade. Like it's kind of falling off a cliff. For one thing, Japanese maples don't grow on cliffs, so that kind of doesn't look quite right you would want it to be, like a juniper or, or, or a pine or something like that. So it probably doesn't work real well, that direction. What I'm thinking about doing is I really like this angle here we have in this, in this trunk. It kind of comes up here and has a bend. And there it kind of looks kind of neat, but if you move it over a little bit more, you accentuate that curve. You bring the foliage down a little bit. So that's what I think I'm going to do with it. And it's going to be what it's, I'm going to make it into a style, which is a Chinese style, and that is called looking over the water. looking over the water, okay? And, uh, and, the, uh, and it's saying that kind of the sort of thing that you'd have on the edge of a, of a pond or something like that, where the foliage is going out over the water, okay? So we'll, uh, we'll look at doing some, some pruning here. And uh, anybody in the bonsai has a, bunch, has a bunch of tools. These tools can be very expensive or they can be inexpensive. When I started out in bonsai, I, uh, I worked with uh, my, my main tool, my main pruner was a, uh, was a uh, uh, pair of wire snips, believe it or not. I bought it Radio Shack for $1.75. Still have that pair of pruners or that pair of wire snips, okay? I used that for probably the first eight or 10 years, a lot with bonsai, till I decided I was gonna spend a little more money on things. One of your most important things you could have is a, is a pair of pruners. And uh, these can be, uh, they're very sharp. They're only gonna cost you about 20 bucks. And for bigger things, we have what's called concave pruners. And uh, they'll actually cut into the stem. Uh, we gotta make sure that Tabitha and any other horticulturist isn't listening to this because in bonsai, you actually, when you prune off a branch, you actually cut into the trunk a little bit. The old idea that you leave a, uh, leave a natural branch stub there doesn't apply in bonsai because you want that to heal smooth, okay? And so we actually do some things that are using horticulture, but we're also looking at art. And some things that are, used, that are kind of caused Terms that that that, are, that refer to bonsai are 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 uh, tree sculpture or horticulture and art or three-dimensional poetry. 
someone's called, okay? And so you're trying to do a combination of, of horticulture and, uh, and, the, uh, and, and art. And we have this old branch here just sitting here. And in some cases we might use that, it makes a tree look older, but we're not gonna use it here. Let's take that off. We've got a dead stem here, kind of cut that off. And many times what you want to do is you're wanting to kind of kind of assinuate or, or, or show what you've got in the way of main, main uh, uh, branches. And so I'm going to move this direction here. It's going to come down a little bit like this. I'm going to move down and so on. And so I'm kind of wanting to have a weeping effect. And you try to make a tree that may be fairly young look like an old tree. And associated with that is older trees have drooping branches or branches that go down. They do not have shoots that come up like this one right here, okay? And so we're gonna take this one off. We do that associated with typical good pruning practices. We're looking here. I don't wanna take it necessarily all the way down to the stem to, because we've got some nice stuff that's going on in here, some, some foliage, it's gonna fill the center part. So I think I'm gonna take it off right about there take off take off that sort of thing. So I'll take my concave pruners and come in here and do a, do a cut like that. Okay. And uh, got another one sticking up here. We'll take it out, leave the ones on either side. And what we're doing a lot of times is what we call directional pruning. Essentially the idea is but you have three types of buds that occur on, on trees and shrubs. One are apical buds, and they're at the end of the branch, okay? And they're producing hormones at this end of the branch that will many times keep other branches, other buds from, from, uh, from breaking and putting out foliage lower down. And so many times when you cut off the end of a branch, you will allow more branching lower down. Now, Japanese maple has a lot of branching, does not have strong apical dominance but on some other types of plants you will more so. For instance, a fig, many times you cut the top off, many times you get a lot of, a lot of, a lot of ramifications. And so you have an apical bud and it's producing hormones, it's kind of, kind of controlling that branch on down from it. And, and more so the closest it is to the tip, all right? The other type you have are, are axillary buds. And axillary buds are at the leaf axils. For instance, right here, you have a bud sitting here. And on a, uh, on a maple, we have, maples have opposite leaves, which means that you have a leaf, leaf coming off on one side and a leaf coming off on, just opposite the stem on it. And so depending on which leaf you cut off, you leave, you leave a bud that will grow the direction you want it. If you wanted this particular branch to branch and go this direction, you would cut off this leaf and it would tend to grow that direction, all right? If you wanted to go this direction, you cut off this leaf, which will tend to feed this bud and cause it to, to sprout and grow. And so you can directionally prune the plant the way you wanna, wanna have it. We will, uh, we will do some pruning off associated with it. And the third type are axillary, are, uh, adventitious buds and they will form that's what we refer to as back budding where they will bud off on a, on a bare stem and uh, if you have uh, and they're just underneath uh, buds that will form underneath a bark right and so uh, so we're taking off some of this this uh, foliage here and uh, we're probably uh, I can see by the clock I'm starting to run out of some time here so we won't do a whole lot associated with this as far as pruning we do have uh, we do have a uh, a branch here that tends to go down quite a lot, and generally downward. Two kinds of branches you really don't want on a bonsai: those that go straight up and those that go straight down. So we're going to take out a few of those downward sloping branches, and I'm going right in to the uh, to the stem there. All right. And uh, that's looking pretty good for what I want to do. Oh, we've got, we've got that one sticking down, but he's going to be in the back side of my finished plant, I think. Yeah. So I'm going to leave him. This one I'm going to leave. 
That's what I'm going to leave because it's going to fill in the back, kind of provide some depth to the plant. All right. So, uh, so there we're we're at that at that point. Let's look at what we want to do as far as uh, as as uh, the root system goes. We'll do a little bit of wiring once we do once we do a little bit more here on it. I guess I can see how it's going to be a little bit better. Uh, associated with bonsai is that we tend to use a sharpened chopstick in order to uh, in order to loosen the soil around the roots. Some people take the roots all the way down to the bare roots. Uh, most people do not. I happen to have where you have a very thick root ball. I will use uh, one of these uh, stainless steel chopsticks that I bought. Uh, but you can also find them as, uh, as darning needles. It looks like the same thing. They probably are the same. But essentially, one of your most important tools you use is a sharpened chopstick. How do you get a sharpened chopstick? You go to a Chinese restaurant, get chopsticks, take them home, put them in a pencil sharpener. Sharpens them. And we can essentially take the soil off the roots. Get rid of the turntable. Let me take the soil off the roots. See what we've got. It's got a lot of bark in the soil. It's good drainage. Uh, let me see some other things that you talk. Oh, that's right. Uh, wintering bonsai. Always mentioned the idea that you that you would use a uh, uh, that you would use a uh, uh, you can either put various people winter bonsai various ways, tempered bonsai. We tend to put ours on the top of the ground, on the east side of our house. And, uh, and as it gets cold, typically when it finally gets down to seriously getting cold, uh, first, ten, first night when it gets, when it gets below uh, 20 degrees or 15, somewhere around in there, 18 degrees, uh, we mulch around the, uh, around the, uh, the plants and uh, around the pots. And we have them very close to each other. It's against the house, so it gets a little bit of warmth from the house, okay? And then, uh, but uh, some people will put them in a window well. There was actually a question, can you use a window well? Yes, as long as it doesn't flood. And depending on the side of the house, you're probably in good shape there. Um, the, uh, let me move this out. Uh, some people will uh, will actually uh, move them into their garage and, and so on for the winter, and that's a good way to do it too. That works very well, and uh, and so there are a variety of ways of keeping that keeping that soil from freezing and thawing. It doesn't have to stay thawed, but if it gets frozen, it should stay frozen and only thaw out once or twice. Now. One thing to do is when you're looking at bonsai, you always want to have several pots because I didn't know whether I was going to have this size of root ball or this size of root ball, okay, a very large one. And so I brought three different pots. It's a possibility. One is a relatively small pot. One's a fairly deep one. That's one I made myself. Actually had a, had a program on our bonsai. And here's another one. This one's made out of mica which is essentially a, uh, a plastic and, and uh, vermiculite type mixture, okay? And, uh, and you always do, with, with bonsai, you always look at, look at one third sort of thing. And so you would always put the pot, plant in, unless it's a round pot like that, we'd put it in the center, but you always put it off one third to two thirds. If you've ever been in art, you know all about that sort of thing. So that's a possibility. Here's another one. We could do it either way. Generally, a bonsai looks a little bit better if you have a large branch going out this way, if it's supported by pot underneath it. It's a little more aesthetically pleasing. So I'm going to use this the oval pot. You know, it's a little bit bigger than I would really need. So we've made that decision. Then we look at soil mix. And there are as many different soil mixes as there are bonsai people. Every one of them has their own that they love. What we use is a combination of turfus and potting soil. 
And essentially what I do, the turfus may be something that's new to you, but you already know about it. Turfus is a fired clay, okay? This is off one of my 50 pound bags that I buy at a time. Can't usually buy a smaller one, <laughs> that's 50 pounds at a time. Costs about 12, $14 for a whole 50 pound bag, it's cheap. If you've ever watched a baseball game with a rain delay, they come out and they put this stuff out on the field around the bases and around the pitcher's mound in order to soak up the moisture. And they talk about it, a compound that they use. What is it? It's turfus. Buy that brand name, <laughs> okay? And you could actually see it says on it's for sports turf. Athletics, all right? What the advantage of it is, is, is it's a hard fired clay. And so it's very resistant to breaking down and it has very sharp edges on it. And these sharp edges, theoretically, we don't know for sure, but we, we feel like we want to believe it anyway, is that when a root comes up to that, with that sharp edge, it will divide and make two roots. And you really want lots of fine roots in bonsai. And so that's one of the real advantages we have associated with it. What I do is we mix up about a 50-50 mixture of turfus to soil, okay? And do I measure it? No, I look to see if it looks right, okay? Many people will, some people will grow their plants totally in turfus and use all, all their nutrients. I personally feel that you need, need a little bit of nutrients coming in with it. A bonsai pot will always have big holes in the bottom, okay? And uh, these are normally filled in with a, uh, with a mesh of some sort. And uh, what I like to use most, you can use screen wire screening. You can, use a little, you can use nylon screening, you can use a variety of things. I like to use the plastic that you use for, for embroidery, okay? And, uh, and we'll need to, this one's been sitting around for a while. I always have many more pots than I have bonsai. You might question, well, how many bonsai does that idiot have? Well, we have, I counted up the other day. I didn't know how many we had. And we have, between the two of us, we have about 22 that we would call bonsai. And we have 242 plants that are hopefully to be bonsai sometime in the future. So is it a disease? Absolutely. Is it one you like to have? Absolutely. Uh, see if we can get this puppy to go down. Come on. Not be that. There we go. Okay. Essentially what we're doing is we have wire coming up through and we, uh, and we put it through the holes in the mesh, if I can get the darn thing to work for me. Okay, there we go. And, uh, and this essentially keeps your soil from, from running out, but you need to have very good drainage associated with bonsai. And that's part of what you're trying to do with this. All right, yeah, that'll work. And so, uh, and, and we have the wires here because we want to tie the bonsai into the pot, all right? Tie the root system in. So we will start adding some things. I got a scoop here somewhere. There we go. Lay a little bit of soil in the bottom. Essentially bring in the plant, put the roots out over onto the side, the other side. We'll look and see what we like as far as a mixture. That kind of looks like it's falling over. That looks like it's a little too far. That yeah, looks pretty good to me. It gets that nice movement. You get a little bit more going down. Still looks like it's a reasonable thing. We're gonna go with that. And we just sign it. The wire here is, is aluminum. You can use annealed copper wire, which means it's been heated, You've gotten all the atoms to go the same direction, which uh, which allows the uh, Allows the pot to uh, the plant to uh, uh, allows this, allows the uh, the wire to be soft and pliable, but once you bend it, you change the alignment of those atoms, and uh, and it becomes stiff. Which is kind of a neat thing, but most people now, including me, use. Uh, I thought I had plenty of soil. Looks like I'm going to use it all. Uh, use aluminum wire because it doesn't get 
real stiff and, uh, and it's more pliable or easier to use. So where your chalk spit comes back in and you can really move it like this, you move it in and wiggle. Move it in and wiggle. Move it in and wiggle. Move it, move it, wiggle, 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 wiggle. What this does is works all the soil down around the root system. It's about the same as when you're planting a plant, plant, plant out in the, in, the, in the real world and you're essentially dumping in a bunch of, you put in the soil in a little bit and then you water it and put the soil in and water it until you get it down to that point. And so there you go. And you use also aluminum wire that you would, that you would move at a, at a uh, uh, essentially coil it around at a 45 degree angle. I was gonna do some wiring, but I talked too long, which is what I expected. But at least we have a start of a bone saw. I would probably wire it down just a little bit that direction. Uh, oh, this is the front back over here. There we go. Okay. And probably move this branch down a ways. That'll make that look a little bit better. Bring this branch down a little bit with wire, okay? I'm not going to do that right now. You essentially wire, attach to, uh, twist a wire around a trunk, best, preferably another branch to give it anchorage. And then you can coil a wire around and then bend the branch and it'll stay. And it will grow that way uh, after a couple, a couple years. It's in pretty good shape. Uh, if it's a fast growing thing, it'll be just a few months. Uh, if you're really wanting to get in the bone side, uh, there are books that will work real well, and probably the best book that I'm aware of is, is uh, The Little Book of Bonsai. came out just about the last year, okay? And uh, it's very good in covering the basics of bonsai. If you're really interested in indoor bonsai, there are several, but the old standard is, uh, is this book put out by the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. Uh, both of these are pretty cheap. I think this one was $25 and think these are up to about 12 and they will get you started and associated with it. If you're wanting to know where you might find bonsai, uh, there are sources associated with this. Prairie Gardens is a good source. Uh, but, and they don't have any pots right now, but they got a lot of nice plants that they just got in. Um, and uh, uh, Pleasant Nursery in Springfield has a small uh, amount of bonsai, kind of the same as Fairy Garden says. We have an interesting thing in Springfield, if you're interested in Japanese maples, there's David Sands Japanese maple on the west side of Springfield over towards New Berlin. And it actually, you have people coming from all over the continent. Uh, one day I was there and there were, there was one group from, from uh, Massachusetts, another one that was, came from Ontario, no one had been there from Wyoming. They all grew, drove in to pick up their Japanese maples and take them home. So this is a tremendous source. It's two hours away. You know. uh, Spooner's Bonsai Garden is one I have not been to. Uh, it's in Carlinville. It's probably a good place. I just haven't gotten, it's too new. Uh, and then if you really want to see a big place for bonsai, Russell's bonsai in Olive Branch, Mississippi. If you're, a, if you're a fan of Elvis Presley, it's three miles from Memphis, okay? And if you want to learn more about bonsai, there are organizations. I'm the president of the, of, well, I'll move it over here. Uh, I'm the president of the Cent Bonsai Society of Central Illinois. There's the Mid American Bonsai Association of Bonsai Clubs. And uh, then there's American Bonsai Society and Bonsai Clubs International. All, both of those have uh, periodic uh, magazines and so on that will help you learn about bonsai. So with the two minutes I got left, I'll be glad to answer anything I haven't answered. Yeah, you have quite a few questions that have come through. What gauge of wire do you use? The gauge of wire depends on what you've got as far as a branch, uh, a very thin, then one, it's not really done in gauges, it's done in millimeters. And, uh, and some of the very thick stuff is gonna be like six millimeters, but many times you're only looking at a half millimeter or, or a millimeter or two. Uh, essentially, you use the size of wire 
based on how strong the branch is, how much how much uh, you need, and that kind of comes from practice. Okay. Uh, quite a few questions about watering. Do you want to keep the soil moist always or dry out between watering? You want it to just slightly dry out between waterings, but if it goes completely dry, you normally have a dead bonsai. So if you are a day late, you are forever late. <laughs> okay. uh, bonsai being, a, being a, a reduced root system are very, very sensitive to drying out. And so say on a hot day, like we had many days during the summertime, we're watering every day, even in deep pots like this, didn't hold water longer, but there's still a reduced soil amount. Uh, very, very hot days, days when we get in the high 90s, typically watering twice a day, okay? And so uh, right now, we're watering every other day. So it just depends, but you need to make sure that the soil does not totally dry out, but it cannot stay wet either. Same way as you handle a house plant in a pot. Okay. Same story. Only difference is, is if your bonsai wilts, it's probably dead. It's probably not coming back. If it is, it's going to come back from the trunk and you're going to start out here and go from there. You're going to lose all of this. And that's where the real, that's where the challenge of bonsai comes in. Okay. Yes, it does sound like a very challenging <laughs> little hobby there. You're okay. kind of growing plants on the edge is what it kind of comes down to. The edge of life or death. It's kind of like you're, you know, you may say being a medical anesthesiologist, you're taking people to the bridge of death, brink <laughs> of death, and you're hoping to bring them back. And that's why an anesthesiologist makes as much money as a surgeon does, because they're putting you right on that edge of life or death. We don't like to think about it, but that's what they're doing. You're doing bonsai, you're doing the same thing. Interesting. All right, with winter, with winter coming, would you recommend starting bonsai now or waiting for a certain time of year? Well, when I was first approached with this, they wanted me to do this program in February. And I said I wouldn't do one in February because I don't like to kill plants. They wanted to have a demonstration, and really you do most of your bonsai on temperate material like this uh, in the fall or in the spring, same time as you would plant trees or shrubs, okay? Uh, tropical bonsai, you do those in the middle of summer. They, they're doing best to repot and so on in June and, July, June and July, so they have a lot of warm weather to grow the roots back in, fill in with foliage before before that lower light of winter comes along. It's not cold to them because they're inside, but they're still reduced light. All right, great. And you mentioned before, Phil, that bonsai is not a, a special plant or a specific plant that you buy. You can bonsai anything, but is there a best type? Well, generally you look for plants that tend to have smaller leaves because they look more in scale with what you've got. I have seen sycamore bonsai, I've seen dandelion bonsai. I've seen knotweeds that I wanted to make into bonsai. And one time I had this lamb's quarter that was growing in some gravel that I actually made into a bonsai one time. It didn't make it through the winter, but it, but it was, but so you can make any plant into bonsai. Preferably it's a woody plant, plant. it could be a bonsai. bonsai. But, but you do better with those that tend to have smaller leaves or like in this Japanese maple, has finely dissected leaves, which give the appearance of fine leaves. Okay. Because they're more, more in scale with the size of a tree. When you stand back, you see a tree, you do not see a little seedling or something that just started, okay? All right, so for a beginner, is it easier to buy one and try to maintain it or start from a tree like you showed us? It's usually, uh, it depends. If you can buy the bonsai from a reputable place, say Brussels bonsai or something like that, and essentially if you've ever seen a, uh, an article, an advertisement, for instance, in a catalog, maybe they're selling candy or they're selling uh, knickknacks or whatever, and you can buy a bonsai, a living bonsai, Probably 99% of the time, that tree is coming from Brussels bonsai. They have acres under glass, and they have very inexpensive bonsai and exceedingly expensive ones. You can, when I was there about a year ago, 
Last time I was there, they had some there for $8,000 a piece, and they had others for $8 a piece. So you know where how deep you want to jump, okay? So uh, uh, by the way, watering, so, so it's, it's whatever you want to do. Uh, generally, it's a good idea to try to maintain a bonsai than it is to start out with one. To water this, you would actually immerse the pot down most of the way in water and let the water come up from the bottom. After that, you would water from the top. But you get better coverage and better soaking of the root system from the bottom initially with a newly potted plant than you, than you would with watering from the top. But when you're maintaining watering, you usually water from the top for the same reason you do houseplants, and that is to drive the salts down and out of the pot. Salts from fertilization and so on. Um, and you can fertilize these. We use a soluble fertilizer. You can use fish meal. You can use fish oil. Uh, we use uh, we, we use uh, miracle Grow soluble fertilizer. And yeah, it's inorganic, but it, the tree doesn't care. It's all inorganic by the time he gets it. All right. More on watering. Do you water in the winter when they're outside? And uh, is there danger of freezing, re freezing roots? Obviously, you water on a, on a day when it happens to be above freezing. Uh, and uh, you water depending on if the soil gets dry, you want to water it. Generally, if you're, if you're overwintering outside, uh, you're going to get, uh, and you get the paths sunk down or, or together and mulched, you're going to get rainfall. Where we have, we have a pretty good eve to where we sometimes, and it's on the east exposure, where we don't get the effects of a winter sun, which will tend to warm it up and then freeze at night, back and forth. On the east side or on the north side, you don't have those vagaries of temperature and sunlight. So in those situations, we do have to sometimes water because we have an eve that goes out quite a ways over part of the bonsai. All right, more on watering. Seaweed water was once recommended to Jane. Um, any thoughts on that? I'm sorry? Seaweed water. Oh, seaweed water? I really don't know anything about it. Uh, I do know some, I've known some people that have used it, but I don't know anybody particular that uh, has given me any background on it. I assume it would probably work fine. All right, great. Um, have you ever used an eastern red cedar? Yes. Uh, we actually have a literati that uh, is kind of growing out of it. We're growing, we don't really care much for literatis in general. It's my wife's plant, and it's an eastern red cedar. Uh, it, the eastern red cedar concern is, is that it's very strongly apically dominant. And uh, so... Uh, it takes a little bit to get a little bit of form and character in the trunk and branches, uh, but uh, on an older plant, you can do that fairly well. My first plant that I actually had that was actually a uh, one that I used as a Christmas tree initially, and I folded up a little tiny one, and, and I kept that alive for several months. That kind of got me the bug as far as having trees and pots. <laughs> Uh, Phil, do you ever recommend st starting bonsai from seed? Uh, you can. Um, we do quite a bit of that, or some of that. Um, one thing that you have is you normally have a tap root that tends to go down on a seedling, and typically one of the times you're going you're gonna to plant the seeds in a relatively small container and then build them up to larger containers as the root system increases, somewhere along the line, once you get enough fibrous roots coming out from, from the side, you normally are going to clip off that tap root of a bonsai in order to get more of a spreading root system. We tend to use with bonsai more in the way of rooted cuttings or air layering where you actually get a very broad, uh, shallow root system, which is beneficial for bonsai because you put them in a shallow pot. Mm -hmm. So is there a certain size required to be classified as a bonsai? No, there is not. Uh, they have different names. Uh, the Japanese name for the tiniest bonsai are called mame, and mame is defined as one that you can hold in the palm of your hand. But the, but the upper, there is no upper level essentially for bonsai, except generally it's felt that the tree with its pot should be able to be carried by no more than two or three men. That's mean. I've seen I've seen bonsai that are that are 10, 15 feet tall, but they're still in a pot. They're still in a shallow pot, 
they're still maintained as bonsai. In fact, the most famous bonsai in North America is called Goshen. Many times you put a name on trees. It actually is a forest of junipers produced by John Naka, who, uh, who gave that to the National Bonsai Museum in Washington, D.C. Uh, and it is, it's made up of, uh, I think it's about 13 or so trees that uh, are anywhere from an inch in diameter trunks to two or three inch in diameter trunks and makes a forest look of it. That's another style of bonsai. And that's probably the most famous bonsai in North America. So it's a, um, it's a, it's one that you would probably take two good sized hefty dudes to move that sucker. It's a, it's a big, it's, it's probably three or four or five feet across in the pot. And uh, so it's, uh, so they can be quite large. It's how they're styled, how they're maintained, and so on and makes them a bonsai, not uh, size. Size does not matter. Hmm.